Hello, everybody. Welcome back to Introduction to Physics Lesson 12. So uh, last week, we were talking about Newton's laws of motion and how to apply those in certain scenarios. We're going to do a little bit more advanced scenarios today. So how to apply those when we have multiple forces, forces acting on angles, multiple objects. Um, we saw some of that last Thursday, but we're going to see more examples of that today. Um, tomorrow, we're going to move into friction and how that will affect things. And then really, that's the end of Newton's laws, and we'll be moving into our next topic after that. So hopefully, over the next two days, you'll see enough examples of applying Newton's laws of motion to feel pretty confident putting his laws of motion into motion. Uh, so yeah, let's go ahead and do it. Lesson 12. Here we go. So whenever we're dealing with um, solving this type of problem, really solving any type of problem, um, we're going to follow more or less the same strategy every time. Um, so these, this outline is like specifically geared towards solving Newton's laws problems. But I went through this problem solving strategy way back in the beginning as well. Like, the first week that we were together. This is the problem solving strategy that the textbook outlines for every single example that they do. Um, and it really helps guide your thinking as you're going through any type of physics problem. So we're just gonna quickly run through this problem solving strategy and then we'll be applying this in each of our examples today. So the first thing that you wanna do when you're solving a physics problem is identify. Um, so remember it had the acronym like IC. Um, so the I stands for identify. And so when we're identifying, we're looking for those key words in the scenario. Last week, I talked about those, some of those key phrases that you look for. At rest, constant velocity, terminal velocity, constant speed. These sorts of phrases are helpful and give you a lot of information without ne necessarily giving you a number to look for. So of course, when we're given numbers, they automatically jump out at us as important, but these phrases are equally as important as those numbers that you're given. We wanna determine the number of objects that are interacting in the scenario. So of course, if there's more than one object, then we can apply Newton's third law, which tells us for every action force, there's an equal and opposite reaction force. Remember, a reaction is not the same thing as a result. It's those two forces that are equal to each other in size, opposite to each other in direction. We're gonna determine our target variables. So what specifically we are looking for as a result of the problem. So that could be the magnitude of a force. It could be the components of the force, which direction it's acting in, an acceleration, a mass. It could be anything. Uh, but we want to identify what it is that we're looking for so that we know what kinds of equations to apply. The next step is set up. We want to set up the problem. So first of all, and I say this all the time, make a sketch of the scenario. Draw what you think is happening. Show the dimensions. Show the angles that forces are acting on. Um, just draw as much information as you can into this picture. And that's gonna help you really kind of just visualize what's happening here. Step two is to draw a free body diagram for each object. So you wanna keep separate objects with separate free body diagrams. Some of the forces may be the same on each diagram and we'll show you some examples of that. Um, but you wanna have a separate free body diagram for each object because each object might have different forces acting on it. Um, so we want to include only the forces that are acting on that particular object um, and not draw the forces that are acting by, like, that, that the object is doing by the object on something else. So we just show the forces that are acting on the object. And if we know the magnitudes and the directions, we want to include that information as well. Remember, we always draw forces as arrows coming out of the object, even if the force in the diagram that you drew might be like pushing on the object, you want to draw it as an arrow coming out. 
So this um, under step three, this other bullet, for each force on the object, ask yourself what other object is causing that force? And if you can't answer that question, then it's possible that that force doesn't actually exist. Um, so especially when we talk about rotational motion, we'll come back to this idea of forces, specifically centripetal and centrifugal forces. Now that's not actually how you say them. It's centripetal and centrifugal. When you say it fast enough, it's kind of hard to hear the difference. So I call them centripetal and centrifugal, just so you can hear the difference. One of those is a real force, and one of those is an imaginary force that we think is there, but actually isn't. Um, so that's why we need to ask ourselves, what is causing this force? If I don't know, then it might not actually be there. Step four, choose a set of coordinates and pick which direction is positive and which is negative. It doesn't matter as long as it is consistent throughout the entire problem. So usually it's easiest to make the axes parallel to the, the horizontal and the vertical like we have been doing. But when we have problems where something is on an incline or on a ramp, sometimes it makes the math easier to change our coordinate system. So instead of having it oriented like this, we orient it on an angle as well. And I'll go through an example like that tomorrow where we rotate the coordinate system and I'll show you how that helps simplify the math. But like I said, it doesn't matter what coordinate system you choose and which directions you choose to be positive or negative as long as it's consistent. The next step is to execute. So actually carry out the problem, do the math. So you wanna find the components of each force if it's acting on an angle. Uh, remember that the magnitude of a force is always positive because that just tells us how big it is, what the size is, but the components of a force can be positive or negative. So this is where we'll apply our trig identities. Again, I'll refer to SOHCAHTOA as that kind of memory device. Um, sometimes in, in textbooks and things, you'll see a wiggly line drawn through a force that's been broken down into its components. Just so we remember that we've already done something with that force. And so we're not gonna include it anywhere. We're just gonna think about its components now. Um, step two of this is set the algebraic sum of all of the X forces equal to zero if it's in equilibrium. So remember, positive forces plus negative forces um, is how we do a vector sum or an algebraic sum because forces are vectors and direction matters. Um, so it'll equal zero if the object is in equilibrium. So either not moving or moving at a constant velocity, both of those are considered equilibrium, or it will equal ma if it's not in equilibrium. So if there is some kind of change in its motion, then our net force is going to equal m times a. And then in a separate equation, we would do the same for the y components. Again, we have to keep x components and y components separate. <coughs> Step three, if there are two or more objects, then we would do that same process for every object in the scenario. And if these two, or if the multiple objects are interacting with each other in some way, like last Thursday, we saw an example of box A pushing against box B and like both of them sliding along the ground. So that would be two objects interacting with each other. Then we use Newton's third law to relate those forces because they know that they will be equal and opposite in Newton's third law. Step four, make sure you have as many independent equations as there are unknown quantities. Um, so sometimes we'll need additional information in order to solve the problem. So sometimes it might be easier to start with the x direction and then solve for the y direction. Sometimes it'll be easier to do it in reverse. So starting with the y direction and then going to the x direction. It just depends on where we have the most information. And then we'll use those equations, of course, to solve for the variables that we're actually supposed to look for. And last step, 
which is a very important step, do not skip this, um, is to evaluate your answer. Does it make sense? So check your signs. Remember, if it's moving traditionally left or down or backwards, your answer should be negative in most cases. Uh, if the result is a formula where you know there's some variable that we just don't have a number for, where the answer is left in terms of a variable, then try different numbers for that variable, special cases, uh, and just plug some numbers in to see if the results make sense. All right, so again, this is the general outline of the process that we use to solve these problems. And so now let's do it. <laughs> let's solve some problems. Um, so here's just a really quick warm up question. We have this scenario, a box kind of sitting on a floor or a table, some kind of surface. And we're pushing down on it at an angle of 45 degrees with a force of 10 newtons. I mean, we're told that the box has a mass of seven kilograms. So here's the question. What is the acceleration of the box in the y direction? Take a quick second and think about it, and we'll talk about it together. All right, that should have been long enough for you um, because the acceleration is zero. All right, let's think about what's happening here. If the acceleration were not zero in the y direction or vertically, then that box would either be moving downward through the table or it'd be launched up into the air. There would be some change in its motion vertically. And that's not what's going to happen here. The box is going to slide sideways, not up or down. So we should, uh, we should know fairly quickly that our acceleration in the y direction is zero. Now, what forces are acting in the y direction? Take a moment and think about this answer. All right, so there are some forces that we should know pretty quickly. First of all, the force of gravity always present on Earth, um, or when you're really close to like any massive object, the moon, the sun, whatever, gravity is going to be there. Um, so we know we have gravity, which is pulling straight down. We know that it's sitting on a surface. So we have the normal force. And again, normal force means perpendicular to your surface. So that'll be pointed straight up. But those are not the only two forces that are acting in the y direction. Because we're pushing on this box at an angle. So there's some y component to this applied force as well. And since we're pushing down onto the box, there's going to be some downward applied force. It's not going to be equal to 10 newtons because some of that force is going to be used to move the box sideways. Right? There is an x component to this force as well, but some of that 10 newtons of force is going to be in the y direction. Now, is the magnitude of the normal force equal to mass times g or to the force of gravity? Yes or no? Well, think about what this object is doing, right? In the y direction, it's not changing its motion. So it's in equilibrium in the y direction which means the total force up equals the total force down. However, gravity is not the only force in the down direction because we just talked about how some of your applied force is also in the down direction. So in this case, no, the normal force is not equal to your force of gravity. It's equal to the force of gravity plus whatever your y component of the applied force is. Okay, and then I think this is the last one that I want you to think about. What does the free body diagram look like for this box? 
So remember, a free body diagram includes all of the forces acting on the object, including which direction. So take a quick second, visualize what this free body diagram might look like. All right, at this point, it should be fairly easy to think about this because we've already named all of the forces that are acting on this object and what direction they're acting. Um, so here's our box. I just drew our x-axis as a dotted line um, just for reference. So we know we have the force of gravity pointing down. We know we have the normal force pointing up. They are not equal to each other. So you can kind of see in the diagram the normal force is bigger than the force of gravity arrow. And that's because we have this applied force pushing down on the box. That's not how we draw forces in a free body diagram, right? So we need to draw our arrow coming out of the box. And so we'll relabel it down there. Now it's a lot easier to see that this um, applied force, FA, is pointing down. And so when we're when we're thinking about our net force, we have the up force from the normal force. We have the down, which is the combination of gravity and that y component of the applied force. And we know that's acting at a 45 degree angle. So this would be our free body diagram. Now, before we could do any real math with this, we would need to break our applied force down into its components. So let's think through the math of this then. We know the box has a mass of seven kilograms. So that's gonna help us find the force of gravity. But we're gonna be asked to find the acceleration of the box. Now, we should remember that there's no y acceleration. It's only an x acceleration. So we're really just looking at the x component of the applied force here. And that's the only x force that we have in this example because we're not considering friction or air resistance or any other force like that. So just thinking about the x direction, the net force in the x direction equals its mass times the acceleration in the x direction. So the only, like I said, the only force in the x direction for this problem is the applied force. So you can see here in the picture now, I broke it down into its components. I did that in a different color just so we wouldn't get confused about what these arrows mean. So we have an X component and a Y component to this applied force. The X component we can see is this side of the triangle that's adjacent to our angle. And we know the magnitude of the hypotenuse so um, we're using the cosine of our angle because the cosine is the adjacent over hypotenuse. And since we know, we know one of those information bits and we're looking for the other one, that's what we're going to use. So our applied force is 10 newtons. The cosine of our angle is 45 degrees. Plug in our mass, which is 7 kilograms. And all that's left to do is plug these into your calculator. Um, rearrange for acceleration, and you'll get an x acceleration of 1.01 .01 meters per second squared. Now, this acceleration is positive, which tells us that it's moving in the positive x direction. And that makes sense, right? Because we're pushing kind of in the positive x direction. So that's how we would expect it to move. There's no friction. There's no other force opposing that motion. So this positive acceleration makes sense. It's also not an enormous acceleration. We should be a little bit concerned if we get something like 100 meters per second squared. Um, that's, <laughs> that's a little strange. So um, thinking through our problem solving strategy, right? evaluating this answer, yes, it makes sense, both in the size and the sign. They both make sense. So that is our final answer. Okay, what is the magnitude of the normal force? Well, first we need to figure out 
the force of gravity. The force of gravity is mass times g, so that's 7 kilograms times 9.8 meters per second squared. That gives us a force of 68.6 newtons. Okay, that's not our final answer because that's not the force we were asked to find, but we did need to find that in order to find the normal force. Remember, there's no particular equation for normal force. Usually we have to find it just based on the scenario and thinking about whether or not this object is in equilibrium. In the y direction, it is equilibrium. So we found one component of the down forces. Now we need the other component of the down forces. And that's the y component of the applied force. So in our triangle here, this y component is the side of the triangle opposite the angle. So we're going to use the sine. So our applied force times the sine of 45 is 10 newtons times the sine of 45, or 7.07 .07 newtons. Okay. Again, we know that in the y direction, there is no acceleration. It's in equilibrium. So that means our up force plus our down forces. Um, but again, since this is a vector sum, the direction matters and down is negative. So our up force plus our down forces is really up minus our two down forces. And that equals zero because there's zero acceleration in the y direction. So that means our normal force pointed up is exactly balanced by the sum of these two down forces together. So that leaves us with a normal force of 75.7 .7 newtons, which you can see is bigger than the force of gravity just by itself. OK. So another quick thinking thing for you. Give it a try. The box has a mass of 90 kilograms. Will this box move exactly along the x-axis? Yes, no, or I don't know until I do the math. Think about it for like five seconds. All right, the correct answer here is, I don't know until I do the math, right? We gotta think through some of these components and add them together and do the whole spiel before we know exactly how this box is going to move. So let's do it. All right, we know this box has a mass of 90 kilograms. We wanna know what direction it will move and at what acceleration. So we're looking for a magnitude and a direction here. Two different parts for our answer are needed. So first step, we're gonna identify some of our information. Um, we see here our forces, our drawn force in the picture. So force one is 100 newtons. Force two is 140 newtons. They're acting at different angles. And so both of them are going to have X components and Y components to deal with. Uh, so there's nothing in this scenario that mandates that it's in equilibrium in one of these directions. Right? It can move freely in the X direction. It can move freely in the Y direction because we're looking at this from a bird's eye view. and so. We can't assume equilibrium here in either direction. So in the x direction, setting up our equations, we have our net force in the x direction equals mass times acceleration in the x direction. OK, so both of these forces, since they're on angles, will have an x component that we need to consider. Both of the x components are in the positive x-axis. I'm taking this point right here where the um, arrows meet on our box, that's my origin. That's where I'm setting up my coordinate system. So both of these are in the positive x direction, meaning our net force will add them together, both as positive numbers. So taking our forces and breaking them down into their components, our first component for the first force in the x direction is 100 times the cosine of 60. Okay, again, this x component is adjacent to this angle. So that's why we're using the cosine. 
Similarly, this x component is adjacent to this 30 degree angle, so we'll also use the cosine for this force. Okay, our mass is 90 kilograms, we can just plug that in. And now the only thing we have left to solve for in this equation is our acceleration, which is great because that's what we're supposed to be looking for anyway. So once we plug these numbers into our calculator, divide by 90, we'll get an x acceleration of positive 1.9 meters per second squared. Think about it, does that make sense? Yeah, positive x direction, positive acceleration, it's in a normal range, so yeah, that makes sense. In the y direction, we're gonna do a similar process again, but now our net force that we're considering is in the y direction. So our mass times our acceleration in the y direction is what we'll be thinking about. So in this case, both of them do have a y component. However, force one has a positive y component and force two has a negative y component. So when we add them together to get our net force, we have to keep in mind that force two's y component is negative. So similarly to how we did the last example, the y component is the side of the triangle opposite the angle. So that gives us the sine. So 100 times the sine of 60 minus 140 times the sine of 30 equals the mass 90 times the acceleration in the y direction. And again, once we've plugged in our numbers, the only variable that we have left to solve for in the equation is the one we want, the acceleration in the y direction. So we'll plug those numbers in our calculator, divide by 90, and we'll get a y acceleration of positive 0 0.184 meters per second squared. So that means that this box will be moving slightly up in the picture as it moves to the right. Uh, but it's, just, it's a very small acceleration. And that makes sense because if we compare these two forces to each other, they're pretty close together, but this force too is significant. So it's going to act to slow down its motion in the y direction. That's why we get such a small pause positive y acceleration. Okay, cool. But that's not what we're asked to find. Uh, we're asked to find the direction and at what acceleration. So that's the magnitude. We need to find the direction and the magnitude. So we're not quite done with this problem yet. There's still a couple more steps that we need to do. Before I move on into those next few steps, though, I really want to point out it's important that you would not write down these equations on a, like an equation sheet for a quiz or a test, right? These equations that you see on the screen, we specifically derived for this specific example, except for that very top line, the net force in the x direction equals mAx, and this one, the net force in the y direction equals mAy. Now, those would be the only two equations that you might write down from this example because everything else depends on the scenario. Okay, so when you're, when you're writing out equation sheets for quizzes and tests, do not write out the equations that you derive for a specific example because they will not help you on a test. Okay, anyway, moving on. Here are the components that we found. Now let's find the magnitude and direction. Now, if you remember back to chapter one, vectors, that's where we kind of derived these equations for magnitude and direction. So we'll refer back to those. The magnitude equation is basically the Pythagorean theorem equation. Um, so our magnitude of the acceleration is the square root of its x component squared plus the y component squared. Now we have both of those components, so we'll plug them in. And that gives us a magnitude of the acceleration of 1.91 meters per second squared positive. 
That should make sense because both of these components are positive. And the bigger one is approximately 1.9. Right? And so we're getting an answer that's approximately 1.9. Seems reasonable. The equation for the direction is the inverse tangent of the y component over the x component. So the inverse tangent of that y component over the x component gives us an angle of 5.53 degrees. And I'll say again, make sure your calculator is in degrees, not radians. Radians will mess you up on a quiz or a test or your homework. Just don't use radians in physics, like ever. Okay, um, so there's our direction, 5.53 degrees. And that should make sense too because it's a, it's a positive direction, right? 5.53 degrees is a very, very small angle. And we have a very small y component of the acceleration. So it will be moving upward slightly, but not very much compared to its rightward motion, right? These two numbers compared to each other it's a difference of almost a factor of 10. So it will be moving horizontally much more than it moves vertically. And so we'll end up with a very, very slight angle. 5.53 degrees makes sense. Okay. Example number seven. Again, if you have questions about any of the examples, feel free to type them in the chat. Um, stop me if you have questions. Yeah, it's all good. Okay, example seven, the Atwood machine. Uh, now this is a specific type of machine that you'll do experiments on in physics one lab. Um, and a lot of teachers really like to do Atwood machine problems because they can be kind of tricky. So we'll go through an example together. A string connects two masses going over a pulley. How fast do the masses accelerate? Now, it's kind of hard to visualize just from those, like that first sentence, what's happening. So here's our picture. This is our pulley. It has some radius. I mean, the radius doesn't really matter for us right now. There's one hanging mass and the other hanging mass. They're connected to each other by a string that goes over the pulley. So you, it can move up and down. Um, that's what an Atwood machine looks like. Okay. Now we're going to assume here that one of the masses is bigger than the other, but we aren't actually told that. They could be two equal masses. But if they're two equal masses, then the system won't accelerate in one direction or the other. Um, so that's kind of a boring problem. So I'm just going to assume that one of them is bigger than the other for the sake of giving you a harder example to work through. Um, so, so question here, can they have different masses, but the same weight? No, they can't. Uh, remember how we think about weight? It's the same thing as the force of gravity, which is mass times the acceleration due to gravity or times 9.8. So if they have different masses, they will necessarily have different weights. Okay, that's going to be important when we think through the forces that are acting on each object. Now in this um, example, technically we have three objects. We have mass one, mass two, and the pulley. But the pulley is not really doing anything except holding up the string. Uh, it's really the two masses that we're most interested in. So uh, we're going to draw a separate free body diagram for those two objects, the two masses. Okay, so I'm going to draw my objects as just a dot. We have the force of gravity pulling down for the first one and the tension force pulling up. Now, I think this is the first time we've had a tension force in an example, um, but remember tension applies whenever an object is connected to a string or a rope or a wire or something like that. And it always acts in the direction that that string is pulling. So it's 
this string is holding the mass up, it's pulling it up, and so that tension is pointed up. There are no X forces in this um, example because we're gonna assume that it's not swinging back and forth or being blown by wind or anything like that. So our second mass, again, has the force of gravity pulling down. Now I drew this as a very exaggerated difference between these two forces of gravity. Like the one for mass one is, is a lot bigger than the one for mass two. And that's really just to exaggerate the point that this system is going to accelerate towards mass one. Like mass one is gonna be falling and mass two is gonna be rising up into the air. Oops. There's also a string holding up mass two. So there is a tension force. And now one of the tricks about Atwood machine problems that a lot of students will forget about is that it's the same string that's connected to both blocks, right? It's just one string that loops around the pulley and attaches to the other one. And if it's the same string that's attached to the two objects, then these two tension forces are equal to each other. Because if you think about it, if you like have a string, and I don't, I don't think I have one next near me to like illustrate this, but if you're pulling on a string, you can't pull one side, like make it more taut than the other side. Like you can't have a string that's like really tight and then just like loops down here, unless there's something holding it in between. Do you know what I mean? Like, like try it <laughs> with the string of your own. The, the tension is going to be the same for the whole length of the string. So that means that we can automatically assume in this example, that those two tension forces are equal to each other, even though they are drawn in two separate free body diagrams, it's going to be the same magnitude of tension in each case. All right, so now we can apply Newton's second law, F equals MA, for each direction and each object separately. Now, again, we don't have to deal with the X direction, because neither of these blocks are moving in the X direction at all. There are no forces in the X direction at all. So we'll only be thinking about the Y direction for both of them, but we'll do each object separately. So for mass one, we have the net force equals mass one times acceleration. And this is negative because this block is going to be traveling downward. So for our net force for block one, we have the tension pointing up, we have gravity pointing down. So the net force is tension minus gravity equals negative mass times acceleration. So solving for tension, we get mass one times G minus mass one times A. Now that's kind of as far as we can go with this right now. Uh, because we weren't given any of the masses or accelerations or anything like that. So we'll just leave it like that for now and move on to mass two. So again, our net force for mass two equals its mass times the acceleration. But in this case, the block is going to accelerate up. So it's a positive acceleration. Again, we have tension pointing up, gravity pointing down. And again, that equals mass two times acceleration. Well, since this is the same string, the tension is the same everywhere. We found the tension for block one. Now we can plug in that expression that we found for tension into that equation for mass two. So mass one times G, minus mass one times A, that's our expression for tension, minus mass two times G equals mass two times A. Well, that's a, it looks more complicated, but it's actually more helpful because now we have some variables that are similar between several of these terms. So you can see here we have two terms that contain mass one, two terms that contain mass two, we also have two terms that contain G 
and two terms that contain a. And so we can start grouping our variables together to simplify the equation. So in this case, I'm going to group um, by g and by a, since it's acceleration that we're looking for. We want to be able to get that variable acceleration all by itself. So since there's a mass 1 and a mass 2 term that contain g, I'm going to group those together. So mass 1 times g minus mass 2 times g. If we pull out the g, we get mass 1 minus mass 2 times g. Similarly, we have a negative mass 1 times a and a mass 2 times a. Now, when we're doing the algebra, I didn't explicitly write this step down, um, but what we would do to get our acceleration terms together is to do the opposite of whatever is happening here. So here in this line, we have minus m1a. So in order to take this chunk and move it to the other side of the equals, we add m1a to both sides of the equation. So that's how we got a positive m1 and a positive m2 over here on this side of the equation. Hopefully that makes sense. Um, that's like an algebra one thing, so I didn't explicitly write it out, um, but I can if that's more helpful to you. Anyway, here's our equation so far. Um, we still need to get acceleration by itself because we're asked for the acceleration. So our last step then would be to divide both sides of the equation by m1 plus m2. And so our equation for acceleration becomes mass 1 minus mass 2 times g divided by mass 1 plus mass 2. Okay. Again, key things about this problem. This number up here, well, this is not a number. This term up here was negative because this block accelerated downward. And this one was positive here because this block accelerated upward. That's important. Otherwise, you will not end up at the correct expression for acceleration. Um, we substituted variables to simplify our answer, even though it doesn't look very simple. Um, now, if we know the two masses, we can just plug it in. We can find the acceleration of any system of two masses on Earth if we know what those two masses are. We can use this same equation, the same expression, for any set of two masses, regardless of what the masses are. So this might be an equation that you'd want to write down on your um, equation sheet for a quiz or a test, um, as long as you can remember how it is that you got that answer then yeah, go for it. Um, so let's see if our answer makes sense, right? Because here in this example, we don't have numbers that we're given. So our final answer is kind of like, well, how do you know if that makes sense? So this would be an, an example where we take like random values for mass one and mass two and plug it in and see what happens. So if mass 1 is bigger than mass 2, which is what we assumed, then we would end up with a, um, a positive number on top and a positive number on bottom. G is a negative number, right, because negative 9.8 meters per second. So we would end up with a negative acceleration. And that makes sense because if mass 1 is bigger than mass 2, this object is going to rotate towards mass 1, and mass 1 will fall down. If mass 2 is actually bigger than mass 1, which is opposite what our assumption was, then we would end up with a negative number on top, um, and our acceleration would end up being negative, I'm sorry, positive, so it would rotate the other direction. Right, mass one would be positive, it would be going up. Um, and so we could see then that, oh, our initial assumption was incorrect. Right. If mass two were equal to zero, 
then this term would go away. We would have mass one divided by mass one, which is just one times G. So then our acceleration would be equal to G, which means the object is in free fall. And that makes sense because there would be nothing opposing its motion falling down, right? So great, that makes sense. If mass two equals mass one, then this top um, term would be zero. Zero times G is zero. So our acceleration would be zero and our system would not move anywhere. So again, that makes sense. So based on those kind of example parameters, these, these random things that we chose, um, all of those scenarios make sense in this expression. So we can kind of verify that way that, yeah, our final expression for acceleration is correct. Okay. Um, so this is another example too of why it's so helpful to do problems in just variables. They're tricky because you can't just like plug and chug but they're conceptually more helpful because you can't just plug and chug. You can't just randomly plug numbers into a calculator and hope that it works out. So a lot of professors love problems like this where they don't give you any numbers at all. You do the whole thing in terms of variables and you have to evaluate at the end whether or not that makes sense. Uh, so I definitely recommend doing some practice problems like this where you're not given numbers and you just you just do it all in terms of variables. Um, they're great. And actually, this problem, this derivation that we just did for the acceleration is an extra credit problem in your physics one lab class. So remember that. Um, yes. OK, another example, example eight. So a car engine with weight W hangs from a chain that is linked at ring O to two other chains, one fastened to the ceiling and the other to the wall. Find the tension in each of the three chains in terms of W. Okay. The weights of the ring and the chains are negligible. We'll ignore that. So this is an ideal case. Um, we often deal with like massless string and massless pulleys, which like, the, they're not real. Like you can't have a massless string in real life. Um, but this is just a simplified case. So in this example, we actually have two different objects that we want to consider. First is that engine. Um, but if we just think about the engine, that will only get us so far because those other two chains are not actually connected to the engine. Um, so we want to consider the ring as well as its own separate object. Okay, So this one is for the engine. We have the force of gravity pulling down. And they didn't give us a number for the mass or anything like that. We're doing this all in terms of the weight, W. So remember, force of gravity is the same thing as weight. So force of gravity equals W. Oops. We have the tension one connected to the engine and that's pulling up. That's all the info we have for the engine. Let's look at the ring. So for the ring, um, again, we're gonna assume that it's massless. And here, since we have a force that's drawn off at an angle, I'm just gonna sketch in our coordinate system just for reference. So we have tension one pulling down on the ring. That's equal to the tension one in the free body diagram for the engine, right? It's the same chain, so it's the same tension. We have tension two pulling towards the wall. And then we have tension three off at an angle of 60 degrees. Okay, those are our three forces. So if we take tension three, since it's on an angle, and we break it down into its components, 
It has an x component of t3 times the cosine of 60. It has a y component of t3 times the sine of 60. So now let's apply Newton's second law to the engine. Since this engine is just hanging there in equilibrium, it's not moving left, right, up, or down. That means the sum of the forces in the y direction is zero. There's no acceleration, no change in its motion in the y direction. So we have tension, T1, pulling up, weight, pulling down. That equals its mass times its acceleration in the y direction again equal to zero. So that means that T1 equals the weight. Okay, cool. We got the value for T1. Kind of. In terms of W, you know, it's all good. Newton's second law for the ring now. So in this case, for the ring, we do have an X component because that T3, remember, was off at an angle. So in the y direction first, the sum of the forces in the y direction, well, we have this y component of T3 and T1 pulling down. So T3 sine of 60 minus T1 equals MAY. But again, this ring is not moving anywhere. It's in equilibrium, so that acceleration is zero. Okay, so now T3 sine of 60 equals T1, which equals the weight. So rearranging that to solve for T3 by itself, we get the weight divided by the sine of 60 degrees, or 1.15 times weight. So again, that's T3 in terms of weight. Now to find T2, we'll be looking in the X direction. So in the X direction, our sum of the forces has two forces to think about. It has the X component of T3, and it has T2. T2 is pulling to the left, so it's negative. But again, that ring is in equilibrium. It's not moving anywhere. So its acceleration in the x direction is 0. So T3 cosine of 60 equals T2. We already know what T3 is. It's 1.15 times W. So 1.15 W times the cosine of 60 is 0.58 w. So that's our value for T2 in terms of w. And again, now we know all three of our tensions in terms of w, which is what we were asked to find. And if we know the weight of the engine, well, now it's very easy to find the actual values for each of our tensions. All right. We have just a couple minutes left, so I don't I don't know that I want to rush through the last example. Um, so I'll save example nine for tomorrow, I suppose. Um, and so tomorrow we'll finish up with an example on apparent weight, then we'll move into friction, um, and Hopefully, we'll be able to wrap up chapter five tomorrow. We may have to push it into the beginning of Wednesday. We'll see how it goes. Uh, but if you guys have any questions, comments, concerns about any of these examples that we did today, I know they were a little bit of a step up from the example problems we were doing last week. Um, but these are typical problems that you would see in your homework or quizzes or tests. Um, so definitely take the time, work through them on your own. I'll be posting these notes to Canvas so that you can um, work back through them on your own if you would like to. I also have um, other practice problem resources on Canvas for you. If you want to think through some of these other examples that we didn't do together, um, check those out. The answer keys should be posted there already. Um, I'll make sure after class. But either way, I hope you guys have a great rest of your day. I'll stick around if you have questions. And I'll see you guys tomorrow. Bye.